Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to our Book of the Month Bible study, which we call Bombs. Bombs, Book of the Month Bible study. We're not trying to blow anything up. We're just trying to read the wonderful Word of God. Uh, this is Christ the King Lutheran Church all around me here, and I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum. And what a day, okay? What a day. Um, uh, the main thing is, uh, it's one of those days where the internet went out on Saturday and no one knew it. And uh, Sunday we couldn't live stream because we couldn't uh, think fast enough to figure out what to do. And then Monday they said, we'll be out Wednesday. Huh. So, um, welcome. This is Tuesday. And uh, I hopefully can get this put up on, on the website and all that business. But uh, this is the Book of the Month Bible Study. We are in... Uh, the book of Revelation. Now, a little note, just a little bit of trivia. It's often called Revelations, zzz, 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 with an S. Revelations. It's not okay. It's not Revelations, zzz, right? It's just the one revelation for the whole book. And uh, now, if if you Say I know that, but I often get it mixed up because everybody does that, and so I accidentally always add the S. Revelations, um, you're you're forgiven, all right, all right. And then if someone else goes, well, I'm reading the book of Revelations, don't attack them, right? Don't be like it's not an S, it's just one revelation. I'm gonna insult you and make you feel small. No, we don't want to do that. I'll just correct each other. You know, just go, I'll just want S, or no S, no S at all, actually. Revelation, right? And uh, there we can enjoy just a little bit of fun, uh, but it's just one revelation. It's the whole book. But today we're in Revelation 16. And so uh, 16 is... Well, it's not 15, is it? Last week was 15, and it had uh, eight verses. <laughs> How many fingers do I have? It had eight verses. Well, Revelation 16 has more, and uh, more confusing, and uh, harder to get through. So let's do what we can with this, all right? Because Revelation, uh, as I'm looking at this, and as other people have looked at this, uh, I've heard other people go, I don't know what this means, right? I don't know what this means at all. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a thing, but if, if there's a secret extra meaning behind it, I don't know. You know, so, and those were people that I would trust and say, I'm trying to learn from you. Uh, so there's times where I might go, you got me, right? But that's what we do. We look at the scriptures and we learn what we can learn, right? Now, like I said last week, if you're trying to study Revelation, by reading the newspapers or watching the uh, TV channels, the news channels, <coughs> you're doing it wrong. The way to know and understand the book of Revelation is to know the rest of Scripture, right? Don't be trying to figure out whether it's Iran or Russia is Gog or Magog, right? Don't be trying to figure out whether this, I saw this one time, uh, see the shape of the new cars, Revelation is coming. The end times. Jesus is going to be here. And I thought, the shape of the cars? Show that to me. And they, But they thought they made a point. Because the way we're making this cars these days is a sign of the end times. So i got to disagree with that. Because uh, the best way to understand Revelation is to understand the Bible. Not the newspaper. Okay? Alright, so let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us this day as we uh, study the book of Revelation. May we find in it not just the confusing, devastating things that are listed in it, but also the great word of our Savior coming to comfort us, saying, I am here. So we pray, Lord, that you would direct us into the scriptures this day, according to Jesus Christ and his grace. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, just a little bit of... Um, liquefying my voice, my throat a little bit. All right, so we are in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, and in chapter 15, they had just said, and the voice called for the angels to bring out the bowls of wrath, the bowls of God's wrath. So, uh, 
we get into 16, what's going to happen with God's wrath. And so I just want to start out by saying this one thing, and then we'll get into this. We think of wrath as unrestrained anger. Uh, when we tell someone, you're going to face my wrath, uh, actually, when do we do that, really? <laughs> no, it's more of a theatrical term these days, right? It's more of a something in the fiction books. But when we talk about wrath, we're thinking of some unrestrained anger, unfiltered anger. And uh, God's anger is not like he can't control it and he has a big temper tantrum. God's wrath is really to say that he is pouring out his judgment and justice. So whenever God's wrath is revealed in Scripture, it is a judgment, a justice that is not an emotive temper tantrum. Ugh, I'm going to pout. <laughs> but it is like the judge deciding what is a proper course of action to send out uh, a righteous wrathful judgment and so that would always be upon evil upon unrighteousness right he's not just having uh, a pity party or a temper tantrum right so okay that's where we're gonna, we're going to start and let's get into this here matthew six uh, matthew i was studying matthew earlier revelation chapter 16 the apostle john writes then i heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God okay so thankfully uh, this part of the of the book has short paragraphs a lot of times they have long paragraphs and I got to cover like a whole doctrinal thesis just to describe it but here the voice from heaven or from the temple in heaven uh, we are given to understand, you know, this seems obvious that the voice of God from heaven is always, uh, the, the voice from heaven is, is to be of God, God the Father. And in, in Scripture, God the Father is always unseen. We see the Father through Jesus Christ. When we see Christ, we have seen all there is to see of the Father in this way in Scripture. And so, uh, the voice from the temple is the best, you know, in many ways, the best we get at this time through Scripture is to hear, because the Father is often the unseen speaker, okay? And he says to these seven angels, which seven angels? Seven angels that have been designated to do this, okay? All right, so if, if you're trying to say, uh, you know, is it Chad and Michael and Jimmy and Justin and uh, no, they're not named. Uh, I, I don't think any place would name these even in tradition. There's some places where certain angels have tradition names them other things, but uh, seven angels, okay? Seven angels. Uh, and he says, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls. So you picture these seven bowls. I don't know, picture however big a bowl you want. Uh, uh, picture these seven bowls, and they're going to pour out the wrath of God that is found in them. Uh, this is very often the image of being something in a bowl, in a cup, and you have to drink it. Or it's going to be poured out, right? To drink the cup of God's wrath would be to drink judgment upon yourself. To pour out it. It means God is giving this in a poured out way. It's being spilt, poured over the whole land, right? So pour out on the earth the seven bowls of God's wrath, okay? Verse 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Okay, so the first angel, you automatically get a, the sense here that they're going to go angel by angel, right? The first bowl, the second bowl, the third. And so the first angel comes and pours out his bowl on the earth. And what comes? Harmful, painful 
source. Right? So automatically we get this image, this understanding, uh, you know, that these these things are breaking out on people. Uh, source. I, I, we, we can have all sorts of gross images from this, you know, are they pussy, are they scabby, <coughs> uh, are they oozy, are they red, what what kind of, you know, uh, you know, and, and um, are they boils, maybe. Uh, apparently the, the Greek word for the sore could also be like a, a wound, uh, just the same word, you know, the skin's not whole, right? Harmful and painful, Blah. right? Okay, I won't go any further. Maybe you're eating dinner. Um, but the the uh, painful sores come upon the people, and you think, oh no, you know, are are, are these like um, like the the plague kind of things? Are these like boils? Are they like um, I don't know, you know, something else? Um, and we don't know exactly, you know, what is, what's it going to look like? Uh, is it going to bleed or whatever? You know, but th this image that their skin has is skin disease, right? Now, uh, lesions, that's one of the words I was looking for. Um, you know, we got to be careful to not read into this something that it doesn't say. As scripture always uh, says things and we might go, oh, is it suggesting the other thing or... A new thing is it suggesting a sin uh, because of we'll get to the, what this sin here is you know does this immediately uh, bring about the idea that these sores were a biological result of some action like let me say they uh, uh, someone said a lifestyle disease right a lifestyle sickness you get what I mean that sometimes the way we conduct ourselves brings upon certain maladies, right? I can uh, get a little bit more suggestive in what kind of sinful malady. <laughs> but, so let's take a look at this. They come upon the people who, okay, so now a certain set of people, a subset of all the people is the people who did a thing or who, you know, claws. Who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. In the previous chapters we understood that it was told to us that the mark of the beast, well first of all the mark of the beast was 666, but uh, you know but uh, that those who wanted to live in the world of the mark of the beast and, uh, and live according to its ways uh, and also kind of get along and, and, and even conduct worshipping the image of the beast they would receive the mark of the beast. So not the mark of the Holy Spirit, not the uh, baptism or the sign of the cross upon your forehead and upon your heart or anything like that, but the mark of the beast, those who had agreed to live in step with a world that worships the beast sent from Satan. Okay, right? agreed to live in step with a culture that defies Christianity. That not only goes around Christianity, but attacks Christians and Christianity and any news of Christ, right? So that's basically what these people who had agreed, maybe they worshiped the image, uh, you know, at times, just so that they could get their lifestyle secured. Or maybe they put their heart and soul into the worship of this beast but you know because we understand sometimes there's the even you know the economic Christian the eco the pragmatic person who goes along with a religion just to get along with other people and not because they care about what it teaches so it, it doesn't even say that they have put their heart into it but they have agreed to receive the mark and to participate in the worship so those who have left life with Christ, who have left life with Christ, and maybe even for just pragmatic reasons have said, I will align myself with the beast and those who are with him, right? So this painful judgment comes upon their body in the harmful, painful sores. It comes upon them. This is the judgment. This is not an unrestrained temper tantrum pouting God, this is uh, justice. 
in God's world. This is God sending a punishment for sin. Okay? All right. Uh, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. Now, uh, maybe some of us are saying, why does that matter? Why does it matter that the, the sea would get blood in it? I live in Iowa, <laughs> or something like that, right? Um, well, uh, let's just remember that many people make their livelihood not just in Iowa and from cornfields or Kansas wheat fields, but from the sea, and life comes from the sea, and fish comes from the sea, and food comes from the sea of many kinds. And uh, so wherever people live along the coast, you'll find sea ports, right? So to send uh, God's judgment upon the sea is now also punishing the people and, and their lifestyles, sending a consequence into their life, because now it's like the blood of a corpse and everything that is in the sea dies. Okay? So you get this picture too. Um, boy, and when water turns like blood, maybe to me that kind of sounds like um, Exodus in the plagues that come upon Exodus. We we'll kind of see here many of these bowls kind of sound like something that's gone before. Uh, maybe because God just knows that this is what wh where to strike to punish uh, an ungodly uh, society is is to go strike those worshipers that have worshipped false idols strike those the places that bring life into the society like a place for food right or or clean water uh, verse verse four the third angel in following verses four through seven. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Okay. <laughs> There's one part here that I think is uh, almost, you know, so strange. You're like, what? But the altar is talking? Well, hold on. Okay, hold on. Uh, so verses 4, verse 4 comes where the angel pours out justice by pouring out this wrath in the streams, in the fresh waters, right? The streams and the rivers and their blood too right because living in a society sometimes is along a river or stream I mean, that's where we would get life too and uh, so now we can't get any life from that it's judgment it's blood it's not life and the angel in charge of the waters verse 5 uh, what's the angel in charge of the waters I, I don't know an angel okay uh, I don't know how to go back any further on that particular phrase. Maybe someone does. Okay. Um, but I heard that angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you. You know, you are just. Not like you're just a small little kid. But no, just like justice. You are just, O oh, Holy One. Right? Dear God, you are the Holy One. Holy would be like complete moral and ethical purity uh, I've heard it described before right so the Holy One is the one in whom there is nothing wrong complete moral purity complete ethical purity complete goodness right and he says you are just so in doing these things the angels are praising God for doing what is justice he says they deserve this because they shed the blood of the saints and so you're giving them blood to drink. Um, now, I don't want to get too gross, but this is what the scriptures say, right? Uh, I'm not going to go in, down the gross road. But so here, in doing this, the third angel is now taking the time to say, 
This is what God does when he sends justice upon the ungodly. They attacked. They made war against the church, essentially. They attacked the saints. You shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, right? Now, and remember, the saints are not just the, the big ones that made the wall with the picture on it, right? A stained glass window. The saints are God's people. Throughout the whole New Testament, the saints are described as the people of God. So, for anybody who killed Christians and prophets because they were Christians and prophets, the saints and prophets, uh, here the judgment comes upon them as well. And this angel says, it is what they deserve. So when this judgment is poured out, it's not a hissy fit. It is a temper tantrum. It's not that. It is a just punishment, a proper punishment for unrighteousness, a proper punishment for sin against the church, against God's people. Okay? And then the altar says, Yes, Lord God Almighty. So you know you that this is where the the God uh, this is where God has three names. You know, he's not just a God, but he's the Lord God. He's the highest God, the only God, and he's the Almighty God. And if he's Lord God Almighty, then the other gods aren't almighty. They're less than almighty. Actually, they're false gods, right? But the altar, um, it, this is, uh, the, the commentary says that this is the altar saying, Yes, Lord Almighty, these are your true and just judgments, right? Why the altar? It seems to be a personification of the voice of the those who died the persecuted, the saints, the people of God. Um, and because an altar is a place of sacrifice, and many Christians have been persecuted and sacrificed to these evil ways and these evil powers. And so the altar is crying out, Yes! You are doing a true and just thing. Your judgments are true and full of justice, are just. All right? The fourth angel, verse 8, poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had the power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. That's the point. So they are being punished for their wrongdoing. And what is their reaction? This punishment is... A scorching heat right that uh, that is sent to them now we've just had a heat wave across our nation and we all whined about how hot it is okay um, but that's not God's judgment that's just the weather at its extreme okay this is something more okay a scorching heat that scorches people with fire okay and they're being punished and they're receiving punishment from God and so who do they curse the one who is making their life terrible wouldn't you think that even if you just wanted to end the punishment you'd say I'm sorry Lord please stop with the scorching fire but they have this punishment from God and what do they do they curse God back they can't re even repent when they're suffering right I if anybody ever tries to torture me, it's over because I give up, right? I probably, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't imagine that I've got a great endurance to endure suffering, torturing, right? So when life gets hard, very often we find the easiest way out. And the easiest way out is if the judge is punishing you is to throw yourself at the mercy of the judge. But they were receiving scorching fire from the almighty judge who sent his true and just punishments. And what do they do? They curse him back. Curse you, God, for punishing me rightly for what I've done. That doesn't make any sense. But they are refusing to repent. Repent means to turn away from your sins and to turn back to the righteous and good and gracious holy God 
And they won't do it, right? They won't say, Lord, give us your mercy. Uh, we'd like to be found under the grace of Jesus Christ now. They would not repent. They did not repent and give God glory. It's an amazing thing. They are uh, being punished righteously and they still won't acknowledge that they are wrong and to repent, all right? The angel number five, the fifth angel, verses 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Right now, uh, the Lord deliver us from this judgment. Uh, the Lord grant faith and, and um, uh, obedience to so many people so that they may not have to face this judgment when it comes. Right? I, I believe this is a judgment that will come at that time, at that end. Uh, you know, that this is one of those last day things, the very end kind of things, the best I can tell. And we, we would not wish this on anyone to receive so much punishment that they are gnawing their tongues in anguish. They are, uh, the, the throne of the beast and its kingdom is plunged into darkness. Um, again, this sounds like the plagues of Exodus, but um, they are plunged into darkness and the people are in anguish and again they are cursing God because of their pain and sores and now darkness right and yet they the one thing that would seem hopefully obvious is to beg for mercy right stop please stop the suffering but they still remain as an enemy of God rather than trying to uh, uh, admit defeat submit right and, and plea for mercy like we surrender would seem to be obvious but they still will not repent of their deeds and, and Lord I pray that this is delivered from us and from uh, as many people as possible right uh, they would not they, they are cursing God for their problems and they will not repent all right so verses 12 and following the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. They are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of the Almighty. And then in verse 15, it's in red ink here. Uh, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay. All right. So the sixth angel pours out his bowl and the river Euphrates, a great river, the important river, right, dries up and to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Okay, so in this, the, the kings, uh, we, we can see them as you know, kings, people of power, right? Now let's kind of admit um, in today's world, there are people in corporations and industry that have more power and wealth than some nations, right? I'm not trying to kind of necessarily put that down, but that's just the way it is. So these kings from the East could be political kings or it could just be the great and mighty people that are coming, uh, coming from the way of the world. And he says, I saw coming uh, that these uh, kings are coming, but then out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet, <laughs> you know, these are the, the, the spirits of, you know, sent by Satan, basically. 
that they these three unclean spirits like frogs come and it says they are demonic spirits. Hold up on the frogs. I'm going to have a little bit of fun with the frogs. But these are coming uh, to perform signs who go out to the kings of the whole world and to bring them together and prepare them for battle on the great day of the Lord. The evil, these three demonic spirits, are going out to the kings, to the people of power, right? What if it's a premier and not a king? What if it's a president or a prime minister? You get it, right? Uh, that they are going out to the people of power and assembling them for battle on the great day of the Lord God Almighty. But that is assembling them for battle against God, against the forces of the Almighty God, against the church, right? These The demonic spirits, the spirit of the dragon, the spirit of the beast, and the spirit of the false prophet, um, though that kind of an unholy trinity it, those spirits are going out to the people of power to say gather your forces amass your battles for the great battle against God and his mighty hosts right that's basically what's saying here frogs that uh, these these three unclean spirits like frogs Ooh, I don't like frogs I really don't I'm I mean they're God's creatures right but in the, there's a plague of frogs in Exodus and there's a plague of frogs. Uh, I, I think I mentioned them somewhere else. I'm sorry, I can't remember. But here we see these unclean spirits of the divine or the undivine, unholy trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, uh, are coming like frogs. And, okay, just that image, just because frogs are creepy. Okay, in my mind, they're creepy. You know why? because they try to get into my house. I live right along a little pond. I wasn't necessarily bothered by frogs when I never saw them. But now they come into my house whenever they can. And it's not fair. Okay? <laughs> anyway. Um, but these demonic spirits are coming to assemble people for battle. And right when it says the demonic forces are assembling the human forces of power against God and his people for battle verse 15 happens and uh, whenever the if you have a Bible that puts the verses in uh, the, that Jesus speaks in red uh, these are in red here and Jesus says behold I'm coming like a thief blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps your garments on that you may not be naked and exposed <coughs> okay so blessed is the one who is looking for Jesus Christ to come. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is ready whenever Jesus would come, right? Do I know he's going to come right now? No. Do I know he's going to come in five minutes? No. Am I ready for him to come? Uh, well, not materially, but by faith, my heart is ready for Jesus to come. And I pray that my heart would always be ready for Jesus to come. And uh, as as we are often depicted in the scriptures as having a robe of righteousness, here he says, keep your garments on your, and be ready for when the Son of Man will come like a thief in the night. Now, I don't think he just means keep your jammies on or sleep with your boots on kind of a thing. Sorry. Um, I think he means that your garments are your faith and, and and you let your heart and spirit and soul be ready for Jesus to come and are you ready for him to come in that when he shows up you will be able to react accordingly and say that's my king and he always has been my king you know do I have the faith to say here comes the Savior or do I say what's going on right because my faith doesn't understand because it's a small and, and, and uninformed faith what's going on right or do I not understand and I'm afraid of all the forces of evil coming up against me and I forget that Jesus Christ is is the one right and, and the mighty one who can fight back all of the forces right so here he says behold I come like a thief in the night but blessed are you if you're ready for me right blessed are you who keeps your garments on your faith and your your prepared heart and uh 
uh, keeping his, uh, staying awake, right? Being aware and ready for Jesus to show up and, and to, to be fully dressed in his righteousness and prepared with the good news of Scripture, okay? And so verse 16 says, And all these forces of evil that were drawn together by the dragon, the demon, and the false prophet, I mean the beast and the false prophet, verse 16 says, And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. All right? Armageddon. We have movies called Armageddon, and they t they're about meteors and space and uh, Ben Affleck or something like that, right? But no, Armageddon in the Bible is the great battle at the end. The supposed great battle at the end. I'm going to hold on to that word, supposed, right? The, the great Armageddon. Now, why is it called Armageddon? In Hebrew, it's called Armageddon. So, okay, we got to understand that this is a Hebrew word. And really, in Hebrew, it would be Har Megiddo. But this is a Greek text trying to convey the, a Hebrew word. So, Har Megiddo. What is Har Megiddo? It's two words. Har Megiddo. All right. What is this, Pastor? You're going too slow for us. All right. Har Megiddo is the mountain Megiddo on the plains of Megiddo. So in the scriptures, Megiddo was a place. And the mountain uh, is right next to the plains, of course, of Megiddo, right? And so Har, mountain of Megiddo, is where this is supposedly, this battle is going to take place. Uh, before the mountain or on the mountain or on the plains. Uh, and they are gathering for it. All right, so uh, this could be uh, saying, you know, it's going to be right there, and we're looking for something to actually happen in Israel on that mountain uh, that existed called Megiddo. Or it could actually be maybe a symbolic reference to uh, the place where God's battle, where this battle might take place. Um, it's become associated with the final great battle between God and the forces of evil. All right. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag on this one. There's no battle. Because we're going to read this. Because Jesus doesn't have to fight the evil ones. He's all powerful, right? God does not have to have a showdown with the forces of evil. What we're going to see is God doesn't even allow them to fight. He just says, it's over. <laughs> all right. So, cat out of the bag. Let's read it now in verse, uh, seven, or verse 17 and following. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done! And there were flashes of lightning and rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of his wine, of the fury of, the, of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, 100 pounds each fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. They're still cursing God rather than saying, we quit, we surrender. They're cursing God. But see this, they gather at Megiddo, Armageddon, uh, for the great battle, which we today call Armageddon, for the great end of all things, supposedly. And all of the evil forces are gathering against God to give it their shot. And God says, uh-uh, it's done. It's over. And rumblings and thunder and peals and earthquakes and uh, lightnings. He doesn't even, they gather for a fight and he doesn't let them fight. He just ends them right with all of this judgment and, and so there's this earthquake and the great city splits and he remembers babylon the great we'll come back to that uh and so in all of this uh you know we think even still is it armageddon right and we talk about the great you know the end the great battle the great destruction it's like infinity war or something right Sorry, guys. Um, uh, so, um, 
they gather for this and we even have this picture of the great ending the great destruction of all things but actually what happens is that the evil that gathers to fight never gets a chance to fight God just push you know squashes them he says it's done and then all of the judgment falls out upon the earth and uh, evil wanted to pick a fight and he never gives them a chance and I love it because uh, why play the game according to evil's way right God does not have to fight evil just because it calls it to a fight it calls him to a fight God showed up to the fight and just said we're done we're not playing here anymore uh, right we're not gonna play battle with the armies of man he just ends it with great judgment rumblings lightning thunder earthquake all right and so uh, when this great time comes we know it will be very bad for the unbeliever when this great time comes we know it will be good for us that do have faith in Christ because he comes to rescue us he comes to bring us home and, and it, whatever great this thing is that sounds like you know it does sound awesome not in a you know a fun way but it sounds awesome as in full of awe uh, that this will be an amazing thing of God's judgment coming upon the world now he says he remembers Babylon the great where she has to drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath Babylon the great for one in scripture even in Peter first or second um, was like code word for Rome because at this time in Revelation Babylon didn't exist anymore it was already a done deal nation over and done with um, so Babylon you can't just say it represents Babylon but Babylon in first century was like a code word for Rome right but I think we can still say what would Babylon mean today and I hope I'm not saying this wrongly but at anything any mindset any institution any part of our world that is set against God's ways right Rome at this time was set against Christianity because we would not play the game of God with Rome we said there's only one God and we cannot bow down and treat Caesar like he's our God we can treat him like he's our king our emperor but we cannot say Caesar is God and so Rome persecuted Christians right so Babylon and so now you know what was it it was Rome do we still say it's Rome today like where the Vatican is kind of no I don't think so I think Rome Babylon today is all of those places that are set against God's ways and God's people uh, and that might be in businesses that are thoroughly set against God's ways and God's people that might be in armies and governments that are thoroughly set but uh, apart from and against God's ways and God's people it might be in academia right um, it might be in scholastic places academic places that are set against God's ways and God's people Did I said businesses right it might be in whole cultures uh, now this is not fair but let's just say a, a whole worldly culture that we could say is maybe caught up in fame and luxury uh, maybe caught up in the businesses of fame and luxury uh, maybe caught up in the entertainment of the flesh I'll admit to you you know one of my stereotypes is just thinking of Las Vegas everything that Las Vegas is supposed to be known for you know power luxury you know fleshly entertainment now I'm not saying that that's all that that there's absolutely nothing holy in Las Vegas there are good people there right and there are churches there and the people of God are there too but everything that Las Vegas has a reputation for to me sounds like Babylon all right um, okay uh, and so this is just a picture of the great judgment 
And, and this was the seventh angel pouring out his bowl. And so we get to the end of chapter 16, here seeing this great judgment come upon the world. And, and we'll come and we'll see more next time we get to Revelation 17, which because August will go back to the book of Job, means that we'll get to Revelation 17 in September. All right. And, and the heading here is the great prostitute and the beast. <laughs> so it gets more amazing, right? What God does to the great evils of the world to bring his justice is amazing. By the way, as one of my friends likes to say, I read the end. I know how it ends. Jesus wins. Okay. So if you're saying all these weird things, dragons and beasts and prostitutes and what? And Babylon. Just remember, in one sense, we read the end. We know how it ends. Jesus wins. All right. And in the middle of all of this, he did bring us that good judgment. I am coming. And blessed is the one who's ready for me when I come. Right. So, all right, this is where we're going to end. Uh, so God's blessings to you all. I'm going to try to get this up on Facebook as soon as I can. But if you're seeing this, then you know it's already up. Right? Okay. All right, so let us pray. Again, from the, the Lutheran Study Bible, I find these prayers. Lord, receive our heartfelt thanks for having Jesus bear your judgment for us. Because you promised to spare your people from the terrible plagues that will accompany the final judgment. We ask you to keep us in the true faith. Amen. All right. So God be with you all and uh, God's blessings to everyone. Bye.